Hey, what's up, folks? This is Introduction to Modern Web Development, Part 5, CSS. We are going to lay out the page that we're building. And in doing that, we're also going to look at all the tooling and tools you'll use to handle and process your CSS. Layout has a long and dark history in web development. Uh, for most of the history of web development, lay making a layout for your web page just sucked. It sucked really bad. Started out, you're using tables to do layout, and that's really horrible. After that, we're using divs with floats, and then clearing the floats with 35 different ways to do that, all of which sucked a little bit. And it, it was just terrible. But now we have two really good tools for making web page layout. We have Flexbox and we have CSS Grid. Flexbox I like to think of as it's a row based layout. It's kind of like the way we used to lay out things with divs, only much, much better. And CSS Grid I tend to think of as how we used to lay things out as tables because it does rows and columns like a table does, only much, much better. I'm going to go with Flexbox for our site for two reasons. One, browser support is a little better. And two, I want to flip some columns in a row around, and that's very hard to do with CSS Grid. But I'm going to make our same layout in Flexbox and CSS Grid as uh, code pens. So I'll put those in the blog post, and you can look at those and see how you do it differently with CSS Grid or Flexbox. So let's jump right in. First, we're gonna set up our project to do CSS processing the way we want to do it. No, nope. yep. Vue comes with PostCSS built in. PostCSS is some JavaScript tooling for CSS, and it comes with Auto Prefixer. Auto Prefixer lets you, uh, you know, when you've got a feature that for older browsers was behind some uh, prefix flags, like you've seen that CSS where it goes display flexbox, display dash moz dash flexbox, display dash ms dot flexbox, and all that kind of stuff, it handles all of that for you so you don't have to worry about it. Now, we are going to set up our project to do all this fun stuff. We're gonna make a couple of changes to how the project was to handle it in the way we wanna handle stuff. First, we're gonna go into our browser list. And this is the list of browsers that our compiled CSS and JavaScript are going to support. Now, the default list makes for a lot of stuff. And this, is a really handy web page I'll link to in the blog post. It is, uh, well, we'll let you put in your browser list arguments and I'll show you what all browsers you're going to be supporting with that. Last two versions and not Internet Explorer less than or equal to eight. These are all the browsers that browser list will support and it's a lot of stuff we just probably don't care about or need to worry about. It's a... Uh, the problem with doing a list this broad is that you're supporting browsers that basically no one uses, but uh, it's you're, you're having to support the lowest common denominator of every web feature for all of this browser list using. Like BlackBerry browser, tell ya. Don't care. So let's monkey around with that a little bit. What I like to do, and you can monkey around as much as you want here, is I like to go greater than 0.5% and last two versions. And you can do this and or or type syntax in your browser list. And this will, this will, uh, if you just have a comma between those two things, it's like an or but I'm putting an and there, so it has to qualify for both of those things. I'm gonna go Firefox ESR because Firefox doesn't have a ton of usage, but we still wanna make sure we capture it. And browsers that aren't dead. And 
Opera Mini puts in a lot of crap that I just don't want to have to support. Opera Mini is a bit of a mess. Now we look at this browser list. This is a much more reasonable list of browsers to support. On mobile, you got Chrome and Safari and UC Browser for Android, which always has a lot of usage, even though I have no idea what that is. Desktop, you got Chrome, Edge, Firefox, IE 11, Opera, Safari. This is more like a list I want to support. I'm going to copy that. We'll put it over here. Make these carriage returns instead of commas. And our browser list is a more reasonable thing. And this will make our JavaScript, our compiled JavaScript smaller and our compiled CSS smaller and more efficient. Browser list set up. What else do we want to set up for our CSS? Well, I want to use some post CSS modules, at least one. I want to use post CSS import. That way, when we import our CSS into our JavaScript, and before don't don't even look at that, because if you start to think, why am I importing CSS into JavaScript? You'll go crazy. It's a webpack thing. You just got to do it and pretend like it's not there. Because if you do, it'll freak you out. So we're going to npm install dash dash save dev. This is a development requirement. Post CSS import. And it's going to go off and do its thing. Now we have that. We're going to have to go into the... Uh, PostCSS config JS and tell it to use PostCSS import. Let's go po import, and there's no particular options we need for that. All right, now we're using PostCSS import. If we didn't use this and we made CSS outside of our view components, we would have to import every single CSS file individually into our JavaScript. And no one's got time for that. So now it's going to be all handled for us. Now there's another thing I want to set up. We talked about source maps in, in our Hello World, uh, in, our, in our last video of this. Source maps are automatically built for JavaScript. They are not automatically built for CSS, which I don't like. So we're going to fix that. We need to make a view configuration file. So we're just going to touch um, it's like view.config.js. And we'll look at that. And we're just going to set this up. There are a lot of options you can set in this file. This file controls how your view project is going to build. And you're setting a lot of Webpack arguments here. We're going to go to module.exports. And we just want to go see CSS. And we will set source maps, source map to true. And again, you can go Google all the various things you can set here. This is just a very simple configuration. So we get source map with our CSS. Now our project is pretty well set up and we're ready to start writing our CSS and making our layout. I'm going to go into the source folder and I'm going to make a main.css. This will be like main.js, the launch file for our CSS. And this will just have imports in it. Our main CSS just points to other files. It doesn't really do anything by itself. In our source directory, I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call it CSS. And in there, I'm going to make some CSS files. We're going to make uh, variables.css. I like to prefix these with an underscore just because it's, it's kind of a convention, but you don't have to. We want to set our typography for our site. Type typography we want to set our layout for our site which is what we're going to be mainly focused on today and that looks good 
So what we'll do in our main CSS is we'll go import and all of those things, our variables first generally and our, eh, in theory, these are so well separated out that they're not going to eat each other, but in practice and when you're doing CSS, that's kind of hard. And layout. So now we've got our variables, typography and our layout. We're not gonna send any variables right now. This is for down the road. And as you add stuff to your layout, or as, as you style your site, say you've got a header on your page, you might just make an underscore header.css. And this is how we can isolate our CSS in our code. So we don't have one gigantic CSS file doing everything and stuff is overriding other stuff and becomes a big mess. Now one thing I always like to do with CSS is do a reset. A reset, every browser will have a different, say margin around a paragraph tag or a different line spacing for a H1 tag. And what a reset does is it sets all of those so every browser should be the same. Every browser will have the same margins around an H1 and a paragraph tag and so forth. That makes your layout consistent across browsers and it saves a lot of hair pulling. Now, I like to use uh, uh, Zell's CSS reset because it's very simple. It's only about 100 lines of code commented. So we're gonna grab that, we're gonna npm install dash dash save, and we're gonna save this as a regular dependency because this is gonna go in with our project. We're gonna go, uh, we're gonna grab this. Zillix CSS reset, it's gonna go to that. And it's going and it's going, good. So now what I like to do is separate these out so I can tell where things are coming from. You can kind of tell just by the path. And I'll go at, at import, and here we have to do a little bit of fancy flying. We have to go back out a directory and go to node modules and CSS, is it under CSS reset? Uh, is it under his... Ah, here we have to go tracking it down. Uh, All right, we're just gonna have to go hunt this down in the folder. Node modules. And this is why you never want to look in your node modules folder. It goes on forever. Is it up the top? Oh yeah, okay. Go at Zell what good CSS reset and then we're gonna get reset.css. So now we have the CSS reset in, and down here I'll put uh, uh, cool stuff. So we know this is our stuff. Bada bing. Now we're importing our all stuff. We can go ahead and fire up this development server. Uh, do I change it to start or I leave it? Uh, left it serve. I'm gonna serve. Now we should be able to go to local code, localhost 8080, and here's our site. So here's what we're going to do now. We are going to clear out. First, let's close the close this node modules thing. So it's not driving us nuts. We're gonna clear out index.html. Actually, we'll leave all this in. We're just going to put in our own content. And I'm going to make a very simple layout here with a header and a footer and a main content area with a sidebar. So what that is going to 
look like is we'll just do semantic tags header and at the end we'll have a footer and in between we're going to have a, a content div of the class of content and in here we will have an a sidebar and we will have our main content now we hit save we got a whole lot of nothing because you know we haven't styled any of this we'll I'll just put some text in so we can see it uh, side main header and footer look at that are we done should we ship no probably not all right let's go do some styling we're going to go into our layout css and let's just style the body up a bit let's give it a, a max width of like maybe a thousand pixels and let's give it a margin zero auto to put it in the middle of the screen and let's give it a little padding so now we've got uh, oh you know what we need to do that didn't do anything huh we need to go into our main JS and we are going to we can go ahead and comment this out it's not do anything we need to import that CSS file into our JavaScript and this is again where I say uh, try to ignore this because it will drive you crazy if you don't can't resolve oh duh dot slash main dot CSS we're importing CSS into JavaScript webpack its entry point is your JavaScript file so everything you want it to process more or less needs to go through there somehow so it imports our CSS for Webpack's purposes, and then later on it'll spit it back out. Don't, don't stare at it too hard. It'll make you angry. It's just one of those things. So now we have our stuff kind of centered. Uh, let's go ahead and let's add a background to those divs so we can see them. We'll go back to our layout. Let's go header footer aside main and we'll give it a background of something now when we save we'll see we can kind of see where they are and let's uh let's give them some default heights just it'll be easier to visualize that so they're not auto heighting by the uh content We'll give it a min height of say 150 pixels and the main and the sidebar we'll get a min height of say 400 pixels all right we got a little bit of content going let's see we need to get our flex box going. So we, if you look back at our page, you'll see that main and aside here are in this content class. So we're gonna go that content display and set that to flex. And that's really all we need to do here. And let's set, uh, we're going to make our sidebar a constant width because our sidebar is going to have like the results of our search. And we don't want all that text reflowing every time a browser moves a pixel. So we're gonna go aside, give it a width of 250 pixels. And let's give it, we're gonna space things out a bit. Margin, let's see. Uh, give it a top margin and a left and a right and no bottom. 
So now we're weird. We need to do something with main. With main, we're gonna give it a flex grow property of one. This is going to tell it to expand the space that's left over in this row. So anything past that 250 pixels, including uh, margins and so forth. And I should say one thing that our CSS reset does is it sets a box sizing of border box, which means when we add a margin or padding to something, it doesn't add it to the width or the height. It, it basically subtracts it from that. So let's set a similar margin on our, uh, uh, our main content, we'll go top and right. Mm, actually, we won't want it right here. We will want left. So like that, I think. Yeah. So now we have some good looking content. Yay. And if we take this browser, we move it around a bit, you'll, you'll see it, it'll respond accordingly by shrinking that main and leaving that aside the same. This main is where our map is going to go. So we have a whole layout working, but we need to make it responsive. So let's go ahead and do that. Go at media, media, all and max with, we'll say, We'll just set it 900 pixels now so we can we can watch it do its thing. And what we're telling it here is to use, uh, apply these styles only when we're at 900 pixels or less in width. So we want to set our content to wrap. Well, our goal here is when we go down to a, a phone size screen that you really can't have these two side by side on a phone. You want one to go beneath the other. And we really want to have our header and then our map and then our sidebar stuff below that. And to do that, we're going to have to switch the order of these two columns and make this a sided main go to the full width of, of where they are. So let's take our side our main and we will set the width to 100% for both of those uh, we want to change the order of those as well aside we want to make we want to make that appear second instead of first in that row now and main we want to make that appear first instead of second. So if I did this right, ah, ah, it's giving us a, it's giving us an error message. And the error message in the view controls are quite good. Oh, it's telling us topography.css is empty. That's probably okay. Okay, these are just, these, it's just warning us that the some of our CSS files I've included are empty. That's probably all right. See, when we shrink down to under 900 pixels, we got some stacking where we have, our order is changed. So instead of a side and main when it's stacked, it's main and a side, which is exactly what we want. Our margins are a little funky here because they were set for this size screen. And actually, this margin is a little too big here. Let's go fix that. Uh, aside, we can take our main top right, bottom left. Uh, we do that. Yeah, that moves it so our margins are more consistent there on a regular screen. Let's fix the margins here for our mobile screen layout. The main margins look fine, the aside margin does not. So we need to go to the aside and say uh, that we want no what top right bottom uh, bottom left 
How about, how about that? All right. Now we have our layout done. We have a responsive layout. We have our map and a side going where they want to go. And it is as easy as that. Why don't we go ahead and fix up the typography while we're here. Uh, the typography, what I like to do, here's the thing about fonts. You have to be really careful with fonts. Uh, it seems really cool to go into you know the Google Font Library and add 35 fonts to your site. Fonts slow you down like almost nothing else. They slow you down in the fetching, and they slow you down in the rendering, the delay page load, initial paint. Fonts, if you want to use a custom font, you got to have a super, super good reason. And those reasons are, are few and far between. What I like to use is what's called the uh, native font stack, which is basically using the fonts that are native to the particular operating system. And GitHub does this, so I usually just crib off of them. So here's what they do for their body stack, and this is all of their typography stuff. We're just going to grab that, copy, and paste. Oh, well, you didn't get the body, did you? Let's see. So that should go and do its thing, which uh, probably didn't notice, but because uh, uh, it was using a, a default font before we started. But that is setting the default font, whether you're using a Mac or a, a Linux machine or a Windows machine or what have you, it's using the default font there. And this is good because there's no extra load time it's what people are used to seeing on their machines. And did I mention there's no extra load time? So this is what I usually like to do. Uh, format this a little prettier. It's setting a line height. I like these a little bit different than what GitHub uses. I like 1.4 here. I like a bigger default font. Uh, background color, I, I like to be uh, slightly off-white, like, uh, and I like the text color to be not completely black. Looks like they're not completely black either. Uh, looks like they're off in that direction, which is a little bit into the blue range, which is interesting. But something more like that. Ah, this is actually way too dark. Must be thinking of some... I forget what I usually set with this. We're just going to go with white. Life short, you don't want to watch me dork around CSS properties forever. So now we have our whole site layout done. We have our typography done. We have a modular CSS system. So we can separate out our areas of interest. And this is how we do our CSS. And what's cool... If we look at this, inspect that CSS, make this a little bigger so you can see it. When we go into our developer tools and we look at the styling for this, it's telling us the exact file that came from. And when you're trying to figure out what's going on with CSS, this is exactly what you need. This is why we added source map true to our, our view configuration. So we can get this pointer to exactly where this is set, saying underscore layout CSS 28 is where that's set. We go to layout down to line 28, and there it is. We can go exactly where we need to go. All right, that is CSS. Now we process it. When I go through this intro to modern web development, I'm not going to make like a site as pretty as I would roll out into production because that's a lot of CSS. Uh, artistry and it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the the tooling involved in web development so i'm really just doing the basics and just doing this layout was a way to show you one how to use flexbox two uh how to make a responsive layout and how how easy that is nowadays now we have a site that at least from the layout perspective now will work on mobile 
and three, to show you how all of the tooling works and fits together. Anyway, that was the CSS portion of Introduction to Modern Web Development. And I think in the next one, we are going to jump into JavaScript and Vue and make our first Vue component. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.